Jesus born. This is part of the way we do it. This is how we fight our battles. And this is how we take a hold. This is how we take a hold of it. This is how we take a hold of it. Don't be mistaken that because you're a believer, everything will go smooth. No. You have to be a believer that knows how to act on the word. Are we together? You have to be a believer that knows how to act. How to act on the word. You step out and do what the word says. That's how we take delivery of what is ours. We don't take delivery of what is ours by being quiet, by being still, by looking morose, by wondering what is going on. No, we step out and we act. We act. The Bible says, blessed are they that what? That do the word. We cannot just be hearers of the word, but we have to be doers of the same. We have to be doers. We, made, we need to make a practice of God's word. And part of making a practice of God's word is being full of joy every time. It's being full of joy. It's being full of joy. Woo! We joy, we draw from the wells of salvation. It didn't say with sorrow. We joy, we joy. That's how we draw. There's a lot packed in the wells of salvation. But if you don't have joy, you're not going to draw. So if you want to experience what Jesus has bought, joy is a major factor of it is a major factor of it thank you lord jesus Woo! thank you lord hallelujah hallelujah glory to god glory to god praise god you know what we are doing is biblical it's not just religious it's not religious at all it's not religious at all when the Holy Ghost came, this is, <laughs> this is what happened when the Holy Ghost came and even much more. This is what happened. Because the, the, the people saw them and they thought they were drunk. Are we here? When the Holy Ghost came in Acts 2, they gathered together because there was a feast. And when they came, they said, what did they say? That these guys are drunk. Why would they make an assumption from their actions? Why would they deduce that they were drunk? Because they behaved like drunk people, am I right? Come on, talk to me, church. They behaved like drunk people. That means that, yes, they were speaking in tongues, but they didn't just speak in tongues. Because if all they did was speak in tongues, their assumption couldn't have been that they were drunk. Are you following my logic? Even the Bible says that, you know, if all of us are praying in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, and an unlearned man, a stranger, walks into our company and sees that everyone is praying in the Spirit, he said he will say these guys are mad. He won't say that they will say they are drunk. He will say, but they didn't say that they were mad. They said they were drunk. That means they did much more than talk in tongues. Maybe Andrew was just somewhere dancing to no music. And somewhere they saw Bartholomew just laughing, unaided. And then Peter was running around. And it just, the whole place was just chaotic. And you're wondering what exactly is going on here. It's called new wine. It's called new wine. And when, stood up, when Peter stood up among the eleven. He didn't say we are not drunk. He said we are not drunk like you think. That is, he alluded, yes, we are drunk. We are stimulated by the Spirit of God. But it is not by the wine that you think. We are stimulated by a new wine. Uh, we are stimulated by new wine. So joy is a major part of the ministry of the Spirit on earth. A major part of it. With joy, we will draw. It's a major part of his ministry. A major part. The Bible calls it the oil of gladness. <laughs> the oil of gladness. That means if he doesn't do anything to you at all, it will get you glad. It will get you glad. And you see, this is not the wine like natural wine. When you take natural wine, for a moment, you don't think of your troubles, you don't think of your problems. Momentarily. But the problems are still there. See, the new wine doesn't just deal with you. It deals with the problem. 
He doesn't just deal in your heart. He deals with the mountain. He deals with the mountain. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. For your word is true. Your promises are yes and amen. To the glory of God the Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's get into God's word for a few minutes. And we'll see where what the Lord will have us learn this wonderful morning. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can we say, for the Lord is good? And his mercy endures forever. One more time, for the Lord is good. And his mercies endure forever. Glory to God. Do you believe that? Absolutely. He is good. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. We started up on a subject last week, what we've titled Family Affairs, looking into the family and um, just gleaning from God's word what um, some of the things you will have us learn. And we said something that I believe was very critical and fundamental to we experiencing the best of God within the confines and the context of marriage and family. Um, we looked at the fact that from First Team, First Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, where the prayer was made for the church, the Bible says that, that may God sanctify you wholly or sanctify you completely. Then he went ahead to explain what exactly means by God sanctifying them completely. And then he said, your whole spirit, soul, and body. And that arrangement is not mistaken. That arrangement is deliberate. He didn't say your whole body, soul, and spirit. He said your whole spirit, soul, and body. Right? And that's to show the, how critical um, the spirit is. Um, and how we should actually see these things. We shouldn't, you know, many people take it the other way around. They say the, the body, the soul, and the spirit. No, but in order of priority... Is the spirit, the soul, and the body. You see, because according to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 or 24, the Bible says that the heart of man should guard our hearts with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. Out of it flows the issues of life. Out of this flows the stream, the things that control life. The forces that control life are primarily spiritual. They are not natural. Love is a spiritual force. Hate is a spiritual force. Light and darkness, they're spiritual forces, right? Love and hate, they're spiritual forces. Fear and faith, they're spiritual forces. They're not natural forces. The things that govern this world primarily are spiritual. And so when God made us, he made us as spirits, having souls and living in a body, right? And that's the way we should see it. We went ahead to explain the fact that we are not just tripartal people. Because to say that we are tripartal is to mean that without one, we can still exist. Or rather, without one, we cannot exist fully. That, that's what I mean. But we are actually spirits such that without our bodies, we can still exist. We gave the explanation of we being in space. And how that if you want to get into space, you will need a space suit. But because we are here on earth, we need an earth suit. And that we have the earth suit does not mean that that's who we are. We are more than the earth suit that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says that if this tent, this house of this tabernacle dissolves, it says we have another house from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Second. 1 Corinthians 5 1. 2 Corinthians 5 1. 2 Corinthians 5 1. Not first. 2 Corinthians 5 1. If we 
who have this tent of this tabernacle live, we have it dissolved. He said, we have another. So the Bible refers to this, you see. We know that if this earthly house of this tent be destroyed, we have what? Another building. So the Bible is referring to your body as a building. The Bible does not refer to your body as you. It refers to your body as a building. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul said, I put under my body. I put under my body. That would mean his body is not I. Are we following? His body is not I. I is different. So who is I? I is the real man. That's who I is. I discipline is NKJV. I discipline my body. So he refers to his body as external from him. Do you see? So he is not his body. He's not his body. He's not his body. He can't be his body. So I put it under. Less. After I've unpreached, I become a castaway. So we see from there again that man isn't his body. Man has an inner man. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 16. It says that our outward man perishes, but our inward man is renewed day by day. So that means there is an inward man and there is an outward man. There is an inward man and there is an outward man. So Paul referred to that man as the inward man. Peter referred to that man as the hidden man. <laughs> he's inward, he's hidden. Those are, you know, titles that was given to the spirit of man. He's the hidden man and he's also the inward man. First Peter 3 and verse 3 and 4, Peter referred to it as the hidden man. He's hidden because you cannot see him with your physical eyes. The surgeon's knife can't locate him. The x-ray cannot detect him. The MRI cannot see him. He's hidden. <laughs> but that he's hidden does not mean he's not real. He's re so real. He has hands. He can receive things. When we say that you should extend your faith. We're talking about the inward man. When we say that receive. He can, he can receive. The inward man can carry a virtue. 1 Peter 3, verse 4. It says, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So, the inward man can be, it can be, it can be decked with virtue. It can be ornamented. Oh, yeah. Are you with me here? It can be ornamented. Your hidden man, is hidden does not mean he cannot influence things. He can influence things. He can influence things. It can disperse it. And that's why the Bible can say that we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You know why? Because there is a hidden man that is carrying a certain type of power and a certain type of anointing. And he can dispense that life. He can dispense that anointing. He can do that. Acts 19, the Bible says, you know, clothes, aprons were brought from the body of Paul. And they were laid on sick folks. And as soon as they were laid on them, they got healed. How come that could happen? That's not natural. That's supernatural. And that speaks to the hidden man. That speaks to the hidden man. That speaks to the hidden man. The man is also not a soul. We've seen that he's not a body. We've seen scriptures. But he's also not the soul. He's the spirit. The spirit has a soul. How do we know he's not the soul? We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Where the Bible says that he that speaks in an unknown tongue. He says, speaks not unto men, verse 2, but unto God. He says, for no man understands him. How be it in the spirit? He speaks mysteries. If you go to verse 14 of that same chapter, the Bible says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So it gives a demarcation between his spirit and his understanding. Are we here? So that means he is also not his understanding. And we know that the seat of understanding is in the soul. The soul is the seat of the emotions, is the seat of the mind, and is the seat of the will. The soul is the seat of the emotions, is the seat of the mind, and is the seat of the will. So when we say that my spirit prays, he also demarcates his spirit from his understanding resident in his soul. He said, my soul, my understanding is unfruitful. That's his thinking, his understanding. He's not doing anything. It helps nobody like we see in Amplified Translation. So his spirit prays. We also see in Hebrews 
chapter 4 and verse 12. Where the Bible says that the word of God is powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the flesh and of the spirit and of the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of every thought and intent of the heart. So we see that there's a demarcation there as well. He is a double-edged sword piercing to the divided asunder of the soul and the spirit. Oh, I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. He divides the soul from the spirit. So it is also different. If all of these things are different, it will mean that man can function from any of those three. Are we here? Are you getting blessed? It means man can, come, can function from any of those three. Man can function from his will, from his soul. Man can be soulish. Man can be soulish. And that's why man can, you can get angry. That's some emotion there. You can get so angry, if you're not careful to hold it down, it becomes unforgiveness. If you're not careful to hold it down, it becomes resentment. If you're not careful to hold it down, it becomes a root of bitterness. All in the soulish realm. All in the soulish realm. And it is possible to conduct yourself, you know, in marriage, in family, even in, in, in looking for a spouse. You will think, you know, sometimes people, it's more difficult to separate the soul and the spirit. It's more difficult. That's why sometimes people will say, I don't know if it is me talking or if it is the Holy Ghost. The way to separate your soul from your spirit is this. Pray in tongues long enough. Because when you pray in the spirit, your spirit is being engaged. You give your spirit ascendancy. It gains premium. It gains power over your soul. Your soul gets quiet and your spirit becomes active. You see, because when you pray in tongues, it's just your spirit that is being engaged with the father of all spirits. <laughs> so that's how you, you, you decipher. That's how you break it. And of course, you feed it with the word of God. Because the word is also what can detect between the soul and the spirit. So if something is in your soul, take it through the radiation of God's word. If God's word detects it and burns it, it's from your soul. Are we here? If God's word burns it up, that is, you are telling yourself, for instance, let's give a very, um, very simple example. A beautiful lady, a beautiful, a handsome guy doing all that, you know, and you're wondering, man, should I go for this man? Should I not go for Adam? I know, I know, you know, we've heard so many things about the teaching of God's word and all that. And you're wondering, should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? You pray and you feel like God is saying you should. But you are still feeling that maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> you know that, 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 that value of indecision. <laughs> you are there, the value of trying to make a choice. Should I, should I not? Is he, is he not the one? But then you get to realize that this guy is not born again. This is a simple, or this lady is not born again. Very simple definition. But somewhere in your soul, there is a longing. You see, our souls are not saved. So it has the ability to long for the things of the flesh. You know why? Because it is not saved. It is not born again. The Holy Ghost is not in your soul. The Holy Ghost is joined to your spirit, not to your soul. So your soul has the capacity to veer off God's word. And that is why, like, people put rope around the, the leash, around the neck of a dog. That's how you need to leash your soul with God's word. <laughs> so that when it's going like this, you will drag it back with the word. So if you're thinking, should I, should I not, take it through the spectrum of God's word. There are some people that are at the level of making a decision. If you will just take it through the spectrum of God's word, you will know whether or not to do it. You don't even need to spend too much time praying in other tongues. There are some decisions that if you just take them and put them right under the microscope of God's word, you'll see that it will just dissolve. It will not stand the test of time. It will not stand the test of the word. It wouldn't. 
So we can't do things just by the soul. An example of someone that did things by the soul is called Amnon. You know Amnon? First Samuel 13. Amnon. Let's read about Amnon. Let's not paraphrase about Amnon. Let's see Chief Amnon. First Samuel. Praise God. First Samuel chapter 13. Glory to God. Second Samuel, rather, not first. Second Samuel 13. Mm. Okay, it's a long read, but um, we'll just look at a couple of verses there so that we don't we're able to buy some time. Second Samuel 13. From verse 1, it says, After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick. <laughs> this distress is not that he was he had a burden for his sister to pray. That's not the distress here. <laughs> this distress is he lost it after his sister. That's the distress here. He says, so he did that and became sick. This sounds very familiar. He was so, he was so over the heels. Is that the, is that the right word? He was head over heels. I, I, I have not lost my game. <laughs> Married does not mean I don't I have. I still have game. But I should not have too much game. Because people complain that church folks don't have game. I used to get that complaint a lot in camp on campus. That church folks don't have game. They don't have game. If they have too much game, you should suspect them. Because it is practice that makes perfect. If your game is too gamey, I must suspect eh? You've used this thing before. You've been on this path before. So if they don't have game, help them. Praise God. Don't let me, don't let me dig his eye. Let's come back here. So he was sick. Just for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. And what boys? Hmm. The son of Shimei, David's brother. Now, Jonadab was a very crafty man. Be aware of, be, be very sensitive to these Jonadabs. And he said to him, why are you the king's son becoming thinner day after day? Let on rule. <laughs> Tell me what's going on. That means Amnon was really... You will see this and you will call it, oh, love. Oh, love. This guy really is so in love. I love her. I cannot breathe. It's asthma. It's not love. <laughs> he said, tell me. Anon said to him, I love Tama, my brother Absalom's sister. Now, Amnon and Tama were half siblings. He said, I love this lady. So, Jonathan said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be you. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, please, let my sister Tama come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from a hand. Next verse. Then Amnon lay down, did exactly the same thing that he was advised. And David went home, verse 7, to Tama, saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tama went to her brother Amnon's house and he was lying down there. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in the side, baked the cakes. And she took the pan, placed them, did all of that. Verse 10, and Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which he had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. And we know the end of the story. All of that happened. Now, a lot of things to pick up here. That seemed to be love that seemed to be was i mean was burning with fire but that's in the soulish realm that's in the soulish realm we will need to see we are we are that's why we are taking this conversation from the very fundamentals that we are teaching it from that 
attacks from a soulish realm. In your, your soul is not saved. It, some, some people will see this and say that, ah, it can never happen to me. We well, got to be careful. Because if it would not happen to you, it's not by mouth. It's by actions. You see, because the soul has the ability to vacillate between these kinds of things. It takes a deliberateness to control the soul. That's what the Bible says to renew your mind in Romans 12. How often should we renew our minds? As often as you should brush your teeth. As often as possible. As often as possible. There was a time. Not even there was a time. Recently. I think it was even 23. Now, one of the things God has helped me to be able to exercise my faith for is in the area of health and healing. Now, in 23, like see, sometimes, sometimes I could go for, I could go literally for years, three, four, five years, without even having any symptoms. I could. All throughout my days in the university, I never was sick. I can't, it, it never just happened. I was able to, that was one thing I caught really early, and it helped me. Never worse, never worse. Rarely even had an headache, that's just the truth, Really throughout my days till even service now last year like three times there were symptoms of this and that that came ah. and it was later through the end of the year around november december i just told my wife that this is very it didn't click at first but I, it was later and i told her that this is very unusual that this year actually like three or four times i've had to fight deliberately being down the beat, and then I will have to do stuff to come up. I said, something is wrong somewhere. Something is wrong somewhere. I said that to say this, that you knew it before does not mean you still know it today. That you are strong on a certain lane before does not mean that you are not, you are still strong on it today. So that you are, I mean, you are the best. You were the spiritual brother, the spiritual sister. You could not do this. You could not do the other one. Those are some of the things that fool people. So you think because you've walked that path, you know, you just feel that, oh, uh, anytime. Like something, I will arise again. <laughs> but the Bible says he wished not that God had left him. So sometimes you feel we will just keep arising again. But you wouldn't know that, ah, I'm really not as strong on this thing as I thought I was. Is anybody with me? You now realize that, oh, okay. I think I need to do some more, some more stuff in this lane and get on God's word. You see, because I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Faith does not work on residual knowledge. <laughs> it doesn't work because sometimes we think like that. Especially if you've done stuff again and again and again and again. Someone told me, he said, one of the, one of the pl places that you can backslide very easily is in ministry. It didn't make a lot of sense then. I'm wondering, what, 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 what do you mean by that? But later on, I caught up on it. That really, you see, because we've made a practice of teaching God's word. You made a practice every now and then. You are the one dispensing the word. You are the one doing this. You can, your own private life, it may not be together. But because you know God's word, no matter how much I backslide, if I get the mic, at all, at all, I will say something. And because I'm naturally anointed of God, they will still, even if I'm backsliding, there will still be sprinklings of it. There are some things that you will not see again, but there will still be sprinklings of it. And that's why some people, they are on fire in, on campus. They were, they were getting people healed. But then they got married, they got a job, and you just see the guy. Ah, PJ. Because he was speech young. Ah, PJ. No, 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 he used to get folks healed in their droves. That the guy was, he was the guy that used to, he would be giving prophecy like per second, per second. But now he's low on it. Right? He's low on it. But he used to do it before. So I'm saying that your soul can vacillate. Your soul can only what go. That's a better, that's a good way. Your soul can do nonsense. Hence, you need to hold it down. You need to hold on. If not, you become soulish. 
and you become to you, be, you begin to deal with things from a soulish perspective. You begin to deal with things from a soulish perspective. You see a lady and you feel that oh, she's the one. I know sometimes people around you can notice certain things, and that's why you also need to have friends that are strong on the word and are spiritual. So that in case you are low on stuff, you come and say, yeah, I've seen fine babel. Ah, na she, na she, na she, na she, na ah. You've praised her to high heavens. And then you bring her to your friends and you're like, and then they call you. I say, bros, Alpha, is that the lady or are we waiting for another one to come? I say, no, na she be that. Ah. And if you, are you not picking what we are picking? Oh dear, are we still together? Be careful of making the decisions. When people that are spiritual, that are around you, spiritual authorities and spiritual friends, are not in full agreement with it. I'm not saying that it's not possible, the Lord is still leading you. It's possible. But slow down. Slow down. If your friends that are spiritual, not just your friends that know solid word, and are spiritual, that you trust their spiritual life, they are not... Mm, they're not in agreement. They just feel, mm, mm, mm. it may really just, it may not mean that God wants you to break the entire thing up, but there may just be something the Lord will have you pay attention to. Be careful. Don't feel ah, but is, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Yes, you are the one God will lead. But in a sense too, other people, because they are also spiritual, because they are spiritual, they will catch things. They will know. They will know. I, went with, I, 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 I got talking to, to a friend who was a minister as well. After talking for some time, I said, guy, you've been low on, on some spiritual practices. So there's something that is missing. I didn't see the person. Only spoke for a bit on the verge. I said, guy, what has been going on? Something, something, something is, not, is not in line. I'm a spirit. <laughs> and I'm in line, I'm in sync with the Holy Ghost. Some of those things will know. You will just tell. Can I think in one time was ministering on a healing line. Someone came, laid hands on the person, and he said that he, he sensed a prophetic word coming. But what he heard, he didn't have enough boldness to say it. He was hearing something about dope, but he didn't want to say that out loud. It was just his presence, so he didn't say anything. The moment he did, the anointing just left him. But he kept on ministering. When he finished, the pastor of the, of the church where he was ministering told him, he said, I noticed that when you got to this lady, the anointing left you. It was like, you, you noticed. And he said, yes, I did. He's, he's, a, he's a minister. He's a man of God. He will know. So I'm saying that in conjunction, say for instance, in Acts 13. Acts 13, the Bible, they were going to release Paul and Barnabas, right? But it, was, it wasn't only Paul and Barnabas that knew of the call. From reading Acts 13, it was obvious that it seemed as though Paul and Barnabas already knew about it. Because God said, separate them unto the work I have called them unto. So it seemed that they were already aware of the fact that there's this thing in our hearts. But God confirmed it through their fellow colleagues, their fellow prophets and teachers. Do you understand? So it's not every time you have spiritual parents and they're telling you... Are you sure? Maybe you should think about it. Don't just think, ah, you are old school. Mm -mm. Don't be too fast. Take some time out. do say, okay, you think so. What are you? Are you sensing anything? Because sometimes God will often have to confirm certain words to you. Either by your pastor, by preaching, or either by solid spiritual authorities around you that can help you confirm it. That can just help you, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in this direction. I'm thinking in this direction. There was a time before I became pastor here. I was thinking in a particular direction of going in a particular direction. And then I discussed with a friend of mine that this is what I'm thinking. And funny enough, this other friend of mine too was thinking something similar for himself. And then I said, okay, let's just give you some more time. Let's, let's just spend some time praying and then let's converge again. Let's, let's compare notes. Let's just pray about it a little more. And then when he came friend of mine thought that I think I'm going to go ahead with it. I felt a little differently. I felt, you know, I just feel, let's just still wait. Let's just still see what go, what's going to happen. 
eventually, eventually, what eventually happened was that we could not do what we had in mind to do. Here am I. As pastor here. What am I trying to say? Take, don't, don't, don't take lightly colleagues that you have. You are going to make a major, major decision. Don't just say you walk alone. Mm -mm. There are inheritances of yours that are placed within the sanctified. Don't just veer off on your own and say, this is how I'm being led. This is the lady. This is the man. Uh -uh, uh -uh. We are also believers. Remember there are times Paul will say, look, this is not the commandment of the Lord. But I'm also a spiritual man. I'm also an apostle. And I'm saying this. There are some things that people will get to know just by experience and just by the fact that they are also believers. Take for instance, God is leading me in a particular direction to do something that will affect my family. He will have to confirm it through how. I can't just say God is leading me to give my car. No, God can't just lead me to give my car. Because those are decisions that affect not just me. Now if I was me, single, ah uh ah, -uh, if I can give my car and give myself on joy itself. Do you understand? But now my wife will be affected by it. My children will be affected by it. There has to be a general agreement to it. There has to be a general. Even at the level of leadership, even in church, there are lines in which I'm going, I sense in a particular direction. But sometimes, even my pastors don't know. I come through that blind spot. Rather than say, the Lord told me this. I will just say, what do you people think about this? Are we here? I need us to get this. Because I think this is very major for us. I didn't plan to say all that I'm saying, at least this, this part. What do you think of this? Maybe we should pray, pray about it. You know why? We are all in leadership together. We don't want a situation of, we are doing it because Pastor Timmy said we should do it. Now, it's good enough. If Pastor Timmy said we should do it, that's good enough. But it's not strong conviction enough. I want you to be convinced. And that's why you can't also say that the Lord wants me to marry you. Eh, eh, it affects the person you want to marry. The person you want to marry to must know that God wants me to marry you. <laughs> so there, is, there are some decisions that you can't just make by yourself and just say, let's go. We are going. And then someone tells you who has a good spiritual standing and tells you, ah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe the other. I'll give another example. My brother wanted to make a major decision at some point of his life. I was there. My mom was there. My sister was there. His wife was there. So he just said it like that. He's going to go in this direction. Almost, I knew it happened together. I looked at my mom's face. My mom was like, eh. <laughs> because the moment he said it, I knew within me it's a wrong decision. I knew that, look, you go this direction, it's just wrong. It's wrong. I looked at her face, it was the same thing I got. Thank God he didn't do it. Because it would have, have just been catastrophe. <laughs> so be careful. Be careful. And that is also why you need to have friends that pray. Have colleagues that don't just, not just people that can mentor you naturally. People that are also spiritual. And can see beyond the natural and tell you, Maybe think about it well. Don't be a lone ranger. Be accountable. And be deliberate to put yourself under that accountability. Be deliberate. You are thinking about this. You are thinking of getting married around this time. This is the lady I want to get married to. Don't wait for people to call you. By yourself. There are older people here. There are older people here. There have been, there have been, there have been some decisions, especially, especially in recent times, I noticed, and I talked to my wife about it. I said, you know that if some, some of these things, right, if we will just talk to two people in church, certain decisions, people won't make them. Especially when it comes to family life. You want to make a decision where family life is confirmed. Have people, see, don't, <laughs> the Bible says that the things that you are going through, mm, that your brethren in the world have gone through it. You don't know. It may just be that it is a Pastor Mike and this is not about, oh, because he's a pastor, oh, because he's this. Hmm. Because he's a believer, right? And yes, because he also has some spiritual authority here in church. He will look at some decisions I want to make. He may not even be able to articulate it properly why he will say, don't do it. But he will just tell you, um, um, 
Why not do it this way? Why not do it that way? Why not do it this way? What about this option? What about that option? What about this one? It will make life very easy for us. Don't, don't just come out of the circle that God has put you. Mm -mm, there's a reason why he put you there. And our inheritance should be taken among the sanctified. Your inheritance is not excluding the sanctified. It is among them. It is among them. Are we still here? There was a time Pastor Michael remember. Now this was something personal. I just started talking to him that I'm sensing this. Oh, sensing this. Maybe we remember. About how I sense the call of God on my own life. That I'm thinking in this direction. Thinking, I just went on just talking to him. This was after service. This wasn't even me calling him and saying, you need to talk. This was just light conversations as you would call it. I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of that. And he gave his two cents about the matter. And I realized that, oh, what he said actually, I didn't quite see it from that perspective. I didn't quite see it from that perspective. So this is not about saying that, oh, there are some people that are excluded from this. No, accountability covers. You know, some people, when you hear accountability, you feel like they want to hold you down. They don't want you to prosper. So that you will not prosper before me. So that my, my, your shine will not overshine my own shine. No. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not the reason for accountability. I like to give this example. You are in a hotel or you live in a house where there is, you know, uh, a duplex, for instance. And there is a veranda, a, a, uh, is it veranda they call it? A balcony. Now, you have guardrails on that balcony, right? If you're in a hotel and you come out to the balcony and you see guardrails, would you get angry, go to the reception and say, What's, what is this nonsense you people are doing? Are you trying to tell me I don't have sense that I can jump from the back of my room that you put guardrails? But what's, what, what are, you, are you trying to tell me that I don't have sense? Are you trying to tell me that I'm stupid? Now, what kind of thing is that? Are you trying to tell me this? Now, what kind of pride is that? And you begin to fight to them. Why? Because they put guardrails on the, on the balcony. So you feel like, I know how to control myself. No, it's not because of you that they put the guardrails. They didn't put it because they don't think the best of you. They put it so that, just in case, are we still here? So no one complains to the fact that there are guardrails. No one should also be frowning at the fact that there's accountability. And you see, accountability also is not about, it's not about once every decision I want to make, I will now come and tell you. I want to eat my food. I'm wondering, I don't know. Usually they say we should eat, the doctor said I should be eating lunch. should be around four, I'll be three. <laughs> and our last meal should be around six, but this is 7.30, so I thought to call you, sir. Can I still go ahead and eat? No, that's not what we are talking about. But we are saying there are some major decisions that affect, that go beyond you, that are major. And sometimes because you are also human, you may be wondering, okay, what, what best, how best should I do this? There may just be people that will give you like the house girl of Neyman was sick the house girl said, if you don't, if you wouldn't mind, though, there is a prophet and everybody that goes against you. Well, like, eh, who? Now, that was, that was some level of boldness anyway on her own part. But I'm saying, let's be in that place, meek enough for people to be able to challenge us. Don't see it as you are challenging your ego. No. No. Don't see it like I'm a man. I can do it all by myself. God said it's no good that you're alone. So don't try to do it by yourself. Don't try to do it by yourself. Don't try to do it by yourself. Even Jesus did not do it by himself. He had 12 disciples. When he was going to pray at a very difficult time in Gethsemane, he didn't say, you guys are small. You don't even understand what I'm trying to do. I'm going to bear the weight of all the nations. Bear the sins of everybody. You guys just wait for me. He's sick. I said, John, come, please. I need your help. Peter, James, come. Let's go. Took them, said, Look, we need to pray. So we have prayer. He went, he was doing his own prayer. After a while, he came back. He said, You guys are sleeping. I'm wondering why he came back. Now, this is not in scripture, but I'm feeling that perhaps he didn't feel the kind of strength he thought he would have felt with everybody praying together. This is just my own thoughts, not the Bible. But he came back, he said, You guys are sleeping? He said, ah, Come on, let's do this. 
just do this. As a man, you will need that kind of help. You will need that kind of help. And not just as a man, even as a woman. You will need that kind of help. You will. There are times you may even, if not for anything else, there, might, there may be times there are rough sales. You are in dire strength. You are on a rough patch. You will need some moral support. You will need some people to pray for you. You will need it. You will need some people to just come and just give you a hug. You will need it. You will need some people to just hold your hands and say, look, we are with you in this patch. Anything that does you does us. We are together here. You are not going down. We will hold your hands. Even if it was your stupidity that, your stupidity that led you there. You still need people that can say, bros, although say you're stupid, though, but not, nothing do you. We still did. <laughs> you need that kind of solid solidarity. Solid backup. And it's available. But the thing is that many people don't take advantage of it. People don't take advantage of it. Glory to God. Praise God. So we need to learn to allow, this is all in learning to allow our spirits to take the advantage of our souls. Take advantage of our souls. Glory to God. Praise God. And not be like Amnon. And act on soulless decisions. Amnon there had one of the things that also affected Amnon was the Jonadab, his friend. Because the exact thing he did was exactly what his friend told him to do. That's similar to Rehobo, Re Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Solomon ruled with a strong hand. And when he came up, he said, you know what? Let me go and meet the elders. Let, him, let me hear from them. He went to meet the elders. They told him, look, eh, your father was this, this, and this. He said, but look, lighten the load on the people. Do this like this. Do this this way. Everybody will, will come around. You will be able to gain everybody, you know, in one space. And you'll be able to lead. There will be peace in your reign. He said, okay, I've heard you. And then he went to the boys. And then you boys, Gilon Shelley, ah, or Balola. <laughs> and they were like, he went to guys, what's happening? Oh, this and this and this. He said, tell them that your little finger will be bigger than your, your father's waist. <laughs> he said that your father whipped you with koboko. Me, I will whip you with scorpions. He said, okay. He said, guys, yeah, I'm feeling you. Then he came. He said, look, guys, my little finger will be bigger than my father. He said, eh. So what have we with David? Say everybody to your tent, O Israel. And that was what broke Israel. Made it the northern side, the southern side. Ruled over two. The remaining ten. Off. Just because he didn't listen. Just because he didn't listen. Just because he didn't listen. Have a listening ear. Let's be meek. And don't just be meek towards God and say, oh, only God that tells me. Who is your mentor? The Lord Jesus Christ. Where is your church? The universal church. Who is your pastor? The head of the church. <laughs> All right. All right. Be a part of church. And let the church be able to help. Let the church be able to help. Why are we blessed? Glory to God. Father, we give you thanks. We worship you for your word. That instructs us in due season. Thank you for the light. Thank you for unveiling and unpacking your word to our spirits. We receive grace not just to be hearers but to be doers of the same. Thank you Heavenly Father. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Come on poor church. Say amen. amen. Glory to 